recommend a vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery 4 computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Glispugin, sitting in front of the computer, is trying to type. He places both hands above the keyboard. He gives up, exhausted, and his hands drop into his lap. After resting for a time, he raises his hands again, only to drop them as before. My definition of electronic literature is, I want to say stories, because I always associate stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has digital technology. I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at the screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth lay in an isolated clearing a bottle of red wine, two glasses, cheese, and bread. Walking the sound of water. water. Wait, the cabinet. The sound of water. Wait, bottle of cabinet. Wait, a bottle of cabinet. Wait, a bottle of cabinet. Wait, a bottle Cold Four water, crystal goblets, Four unexpectedly, crystal goblets at midnight. unexpectedly at midnight. Purple lupine on the hillside. Beside the Dempsey dumpster in town, walking down to the water where the homeless gathered. A flower, a flower dress, dress, unexpected woodland events. Wait, capped spring water in winter. A bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth. Cold, Cold water. water. A flower, flower dress. dress, the smell of hops and honey. The, the smell, smell of green in grass. The outflow of stone by the river. The a smell of front green door. grass. Under Warm the eaves of the, by the river. The, the cabin where we were working. The sound of water. White capped mountains, purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My birth takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell, when that's possible in the future. At the present, it starts with image, very dominantly, and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions, both at the code, the sonic, 
the visual and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres such as you know printed text where things don't move around but electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts how we perceive the world and ourselves and trying to portray that using computation using the specific processes that are unique to computers there are two main literary parents for me for the fiction and one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation. Uh, there are there are no there are no visible artworks, but there is a tremendous reference to the language of, of art and film and music and theater. And that was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative. Electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to um, alter the state of writing. It's, it's literature that engages its digitality. I remember sitting in my office in, in Jackson, Michigan, in community college and thinking, damn, I'm going to have to teach people how to read this thing. Prepared, sugar is not a quest, quest in the for glass the door, these certain methods. Very Reach clean if there is no seen variety. Very, very clean small if there is no pleasure. Overly moist Prepared. climate. Sugar is not a volume. Not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness related to the vulture. And shape. however, in varying sides and the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, to use, last, they open. are double. For the sake, and rapid exploration requires most common classes while the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal. Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is it can be considered practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, it resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media, as Amrit said, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information communication. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint, if anyone knows what that is. It's just like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text. The graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read. And the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw in camera works um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, and by the art space at San Jose State that Stephen Muir Moore curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between visual arts and halfway between writing. And of course, performance art also that I was associated with, and the artist books. So those were interests that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine-enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional print or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines, and they don't exist in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raising the dirt, only several colors, tall the one cluster away, variety each a method, package of seeds, disparate. the several not Stone in rows. especially smooth, location chip it down, magnify the bottom, darting and then habitual shadow, seen bending. We're all moving toward storytelling in digital space 
and some of the most interesting experiments that are happening are in um, electronic literature. You're coming out of a, a Dadaist tradition uh, of saying there is there's something beyond this and and I'm, I'm going to rearrange this stuff and, and find other layers beyond the visible or make other layers. I think electronic literature is digital born literature that would not exist otherwise than by mediation through a computer. Electronic literature is the exploration of how we can tell stories with the augmentation uh, of technology. So what technology makes possible in our storytelling palette. And particularly thinking about kind of the networked and connective tissues of literature and storytelling and the ways that we realize those through the technologies we already use all the time, particularly on the web. The lack of clear signals isn't an attempt to vex you. Uh, rather an invitation to read either inquisitively or playful and playfully and also at depth. Click on words that interest you or invite you. Electronic literature can be a number of things. It, it's interactive. It has to do with words and images. I go in and out of what to call myself. I still say different things. But within the community, I create electronic literature, yeah. which, which I would call poetic narrative. So I'm a poet who works with narrative. I think the day that comes that we don't actually distinguish it as electronic literature is the day that, that uh, we finally, uh, well, I, would be the day that, well, we don't have to ask questions like that again. Ah, an otherworldly glass of beer? A beer ah, with black but wouldn't conditions. you like an otherworldly ah, glass of beer? But wouldn't you like an otherworldly a glass of beer? blackberry bushes? Just beside the trail as you crest the hill amber-colored beer in a tall crystal glass, white, white palm on the down the sides. The smell of hops and honey, a golden icebox. Ah. Welcome to the live stream traversal of Carolyn Gower's Quibbling, hosted by the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Dini Gregor, the director of the lab. With me remotely is Carolyn, and hypertext scholar Marius Pazarski, research affiliate of the lab, will join in the conversation um, after the performance with the author and me. Quibbling has been called by Carolyn Gerton, the mother of feminist hypertext. It was originally released on a three and a half inch floppy disk for Macintosh computers in 1992, but then later re-released on CD-ROM in 1996 for both Macintosh and Windows computers. Carolyn began laying out the work in Kansas and finished it alone in a cottage in Michigan, near Lake Michigan, writing as many as 12 hours a day to finish the work. As you will see, water figures largely as a metaphor in quibbling because of the influence of the lake. Carolyn herself wrote that the novel focuses on how women and men come together. Hypertext as a platform provides the foundation of her vision. The gossip, family discussions, letters, passing fantasies and daydreams that we tell ourselves and each other almost all day in order to make sense of things are not whole stories, she says, like literary fiction. They are instead small bits, intimate and personal, that we string together in order to create the pattern of a life. For this playthrough, we're using a three and a half inch floppy disk version on a Macintosh Classic 2 running system software 7.1. Carolyn will be guiding me remotely via YouTube and Zoom while she reads from my computer screen. Following her performance, as I mentioned, there's a Q&A with Carolyn, Mariush, and me. As a participant in the event, you'll be able to post questions in the YouTube chat and to the author, and she'll be able to answer you remotely through the Q&A. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the many staff members and faculty members of the creative, creative Media and Digital Culture Program in the lab who've made this event possible. Greg Philbrook, the labs and programs tech guru is handling YouTube Live in OBS. Holly Slocum, the lab's project manager is overseeing the project. Kathleen Zoller, the lab's undergraduate researcher is managing the social media on Twitter. Dr. John Barber is handling the sound production and Professor David Alonzo is taking care of post-production, editing, and the video capture.
I'll add that the video captured from today's traversal will be edited and placed on the lab's Vimeo channel and added to the lab's annual publication, Rebooting Electronic Literature, will be in volume four this year. Without further delay, let's begin the traversal. Thank you. So, uh, Carolyn, I think we're ready to get started. I have the disc already into this Macintosh, and I'm going to click on it twice. And we're seeing the, um, the launcher icon for quibbling. Click on that, and now it will load. Did you want to say a few things about the, your idea about hyperlinks as this is loading? Huh. Well, in this particular work, um, I was um, very much more interested in having people um, look at the map and make their own links than I was in um, superlinking the thing. So uh, you can see in that loading window that it, there's over a thousand links in it. In fact, I felt like that was a fairly minimum amount um, given the possible variations of reading it. And so, I made that my own reading set of links and hoped that other uh, readers would see it as just that and that they would move okay. around in the space of the um, work and find their own narrative within it. And you could also find a lot more connections um, visually by looking at where they're all arranged. And, um, so that was what I had in mind anyway. And then we are now landing on the um, opening page, the opening screen, which has that lovely image. And while that's loading and we're ready to get started, do you want to mention something about this artwork that you produced yourself? Yeah. I came, I actually came to writing um, from a stronger background in visual arts. And so um, creating a visual um, for this work was natural for me, something that I wanted to do and did. But I didn't have not that many, uh, certainly not sophisticated uh, um, graphic programs like we have now. Um, and I had McPaint <laughs> on my Mac. And so it's fairly primitive and simple um, and very pixelated in the original kind of, but it's basically a set of wave shapes that um, overlap each other. And it's a reference to um, the importance of water and um, waves and um, there's references to that in the text, um, the way that um, behaviors of waves, which I was watching a lot of uh, at the time I was writing this because I was in a little cabin overlooking Lake Michigan while I was writing the bulk of this work. And, um, but so the behavior of waves was uh, of, of great interest to me and I began to see it as associated with the way humans um, interact. And um, it was so I think the whole story is really about how humans, and especially men and women, interact. Um, so uh, that's kind of the idea of the graphic. We have uh, Mac Payne on this little computer here that we're using, by the way. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, well, I could send you those original files, and you can take a look at how. Love to see That's it. pretty much what you see there on that, um, on that image. So are we beginning? Yeah, so we, th when we clicked onto the first link, we, it takes us to this opening Lexia cigar box. Yeah, cigar box. He held the bright blue and gold cigar box in both hands. She had passed it to him with a knowing smile, a little shy. Closed, it was square and just deep enough for one layer of cigars, a very satisfying form to hold, made of wood and covered with ornately decorated paper. An oval in the center of the closed lid, surrounded by embossed metallic gold coins, declared, Flor de Tobacos de Partagas, 1845. And I just use the default reading to go forward. And for those of you who are not familiar familiar with this, this little double arrow allows for a default reading of this work. Yeah. Uh, so cup and rod. When he tried unsuccessfully to open the box, he realized that a small tack-like nail held the lid firmly shut. As he worked at the nail trying to remove it, he believed he could smell the tobacco already. In making this gift, she had insisted on the element of surprise. The nail jerked free as if by sudden decision. 
Now he held the delicate little rod between forefinger and thumb, unsure what to do with it. Her hand, cupped, moved to receive his slender nail. He let her take it from him, then left her to square it. And for those of you watching, there is a bit of a lag time between um, the time that Carolyn can see the, the uh, screen. So that will be edited out once we uh, begin the editing process. Good. Tobacco smoke. Priam knew he would not see cigars, but as the lid swung widely back, the sweet pungency of tobacco plumed into his face. She held her breath, concentrating, needing to recognize the subtle difference between his real response and the one he would perform for it. It's a red moment, as when a jagged bit, intense and plastic, is suddenly glimpsed lurking in the sand and beach refuse, framed massively by dunes and jutting rock. A man's head turned toward her and twisted back away, laughing. Watercolor. For a long time, Heather watched the cadence of Lake Michigan. She watched the waves glide into shore on calm, sunny days, waves with delicate ruffs of foam slinging to nets of crochet fanned out over the sand. She watched some windy days when the cold slapped her face and frisked her body, sky lowering and surf tearing furiously at the land, but it was not this compelling rhythm which held her entranced for hours on end. It was the color of the water itself. She had a good memory for color. The years of painting and drawing had instilled a subtle sense for shade and hue. She could always remember the exact color of her friend's sweater or the paleness of Brian's aqua shirt and the intensity of his blue eyes above it. But the revolving color of this inland sea confounded her. She could not comprehend it. Bottle glass. She had walked for hours beside the water and finally sat alone at the deepest point opposite the mouth of a round open cove. The lake entered here in little hops. Delightful to watch. She remained, she remained very still, sitting on a damp log, watching the bottle glass color of the water in the cove. It was as changing as the water in the rest of the lake, but smaller and contained, more like a pond, and she could begin to touch on the color. Even so, bottle glass was the closest she could come. It was obvious that the sky had much to do with it. On cloudy days, the lake shifted in brooding umber, slate, and indigo. On sunny, the mood manic, ultramarine to deep jade and clear turquoise, lavender, and parting pink. But there was something beyond the naming of these colors. Is there anything as alive and full of light as a body of water, she thought? Fire, maybe. But fire is always releasing the light, throwing it. This water holds light, plays it like music, gently, passionately holds it. Here, translucent, there, opaque, all opposites, all opposites harmonize. And for those of you who were following us on Twitter, Carolyn sent an image that um, of the cigar box with the glass that I that she allowed me to post on Twitter for you. So you might want to go back after the uh, event and look at that image. It's quite lovely. <clears throat> Open cobalt. It was during the long walk back to her room after her reveries had been shattered by the dog that she picked up a piece of blue cobalt glass from the beach. She'd been picking up bits of glass and dropping them again all day. But this blue was so deep, so clear and gem-like, she could not bear to give it back. She slid it into her pocket and kept walking. Almost immediately, she pulled out again. She stood still with her palm open in front of her, the blue fragment glinting along one sharp, broken edge. The lake had been showing her all along. Her hand closed carefully around the glass as she started again to walk. But now her eyes were directed downward, searching the beach. Yes, there, a sliver of watery turquoise edged by sand to fry the opacity. And soon another, shimmering sienna, probably from a beer bottle. The lake had been offering and reclaiming its color again and again. She became intent now on finding it, gathering it. Dusk color. 
The remainder of her stay at the lake would be obsessed with this occupation. Her eyes learned to read the beach, know where the most likely places would be for finding her treasure, and yet still remain alert to the unexpected. By the second day, she could discern bits of glass as small as coarse sand along the tide wash. Her neck ached and eyes bleared, but she ignored the discomfort, continuing until everything turned the same color at dusk. Then she would return to her room and cautiously empty her pockets onto a white towel spread out on the bed. Shard pool. Seeing the afternoon's harvest there in a pool on a bed made her catch her breath. These shards looked so much like the lake to her. The angles and curves of the surface beam, sharp and dull, blue-green, umber light, merging, blending, overlapping. As with the lake, she could not take her eyes away. She had with her a square, shallow cigar box, bought on a whim for its bright, ornate decoration. She'd been keeping pencils and odds and ends in it, removing them. She poured the beach glass into the box. The inside of the lid was golden and hot as midday. She opened it wide and the color of the lake shifted musically beneath it. Prime would be the one who could understand this. The cigar box would be a gift for him. No cigar box. She called Prime two nights before she was to leave for home. She wanted to meet him to give him a cigar box full of lake, though she wouldn't tell him what the gift was, but he was distracted, preoccupied. Well, I'm not sure which day, Wednesday, things are crazy here right now. And I, I have a meeting that morning. It won't take long, Prime. I want to give you this, but it seems wrong to me. You'll have to go out of your way to come here or go against the grain of this trip. I don't know. It just doesn't seem right. She could insist, but she would have to. She let it go. The next day when he called, she knew she wouldn't be giving him the cigar box. It was hers. If she explained it to him, he would understand. She didn't want to explain this. What matters is that lives do not serve as models. Only stories do that. And it is a hard thing to make up stories to live by. We can only retell and live by the stories we have read or heard. We live our lives through texts. They may be read or chanted or experienced electronically or come to us like the murmurings of our mothers. Whatever their form or medium, these stories have formed us all. They are what we must use to make new fictions new narratives. Carolyn Heilfern, Writing a Woman's Life. That was a formative one for me, I have to say, that text. Yes, you know, you, you, you cite so many works that were so important in the early 90s, Hybrin, Helbrin, and also, of course, Women's Myths and Secrets. All of those yeah. texts were just so instrumental for uh, giving voice to women's um, thoughts at the time when we were breaking into writing in an important way. That is true. And that was certainly, I, I was part of, the, part of the zeitgeist of that moment, I guess, because... Um, there were, there were so many women I was reading. Mm -hmm. On a dune, the wind from the great lake blew her hair in awkward clumps across her face. She turned directly into it, suddenly transforming to bowsprit maid, hair flying back, chin jutting. He watched her with small, surreptitious glances. Patting the dog beside him, he tried to return to his reading, but was too distracted by this solitary figure wandering among the dunes. He thought she shouldn't be out this far from help alone. Carolyn, do you want us to move into the map view? Um, that That'd way, and we could take a look around there. You know, I honestly have not seen this work for many years, and so it will be sort of a first uh, in a way. It'll be fresh. It'll be so new. It'll be like me rediscovering it to see um, the way that I had organized it, and it was an, an important thing for me because not only was um, story space and the way the map works and the linking works, it was a, a way for me to write extensively for the first time in fiction. And um, it, it, it sort of supported that creation, but at the same time, I felt like 
because we were always talking about readers or writers, um, I felt that it was also the same environment that um, would help other people make this story. So here's <laughs> Hedda, this box is Hedda, and um, this is pretty much her story. Is this what we've been moving around in? So I'm going to ask Gray to come over and <coughs> take over for a minute while I go cough. <laughs> I have allergies. One second. <coughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I'm taking over for Dini for just a moment while she takes care of uh, her allergies and cough. Um, oh dear. Oh dear. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. It, she'll be she'll be back soon. Um, it's nothing serious. But um, you'll have to um, guide me along a little bit more precisely than Dini. I haven't played with this work in quite some time, many years. So. Um, me either. You probably have seen it more lately than I have. <laughs> so. <laughs> So Hedda is, is one of the main characters in the work, and this is obviously her box and all the different parts. Uh, it looks like we've been reading a lot, a lot of these already, um, I think. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think if you close this box, then doesn't it open out to a higher level where you see more boxes that are other characters? And Ooh, I'm not certain about that. Um, we, can, we can give it a shot if you'd like okay. to. If you take that top bar um, that where you should be able to move the box, it just move touch it of, that with your cursor and then drag it down and see if there's something behind it. That I don't I don't know if you actually need to close it. I don't know. Okay. I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's something back there. So go ahead and close Hedda. I think you can probably. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to exit out of the work entirely. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can see open boxes on a dune we just okay. read. Well, yeah. None. Okay. Move. Okay, so when you closed Hedda, it went to none. Yes, and then yeah. to moon. Okay, so bring that up a little bit. It's hard for me to see on the, right. um, on the YouTube screen. There we go. You just box up a little bit. I'm not sure what you're looking at on your end. So. Oh, okay. Um, ah, there we go. Okay, so moon. Um, we can go into any of these boxes if you want like mothers or quibbler or i think quibbler would be great because that's the title and this is the only yeah. lexia that it's references not, sure it very much. yeah quibbler would be fine and get it to open here come on quibbler oops come on you got that delay thing no it's just not uh it's not opening, oh, it's not opening. isn't that strange wow huh there we go none is opening though maybe there we go. Let's see if we can get to Agnes. It's so interesting because normally... Agnes, okay. None of these boxes are opening. That is so strange. I'm going to go back here to Vera, yeah. and let's just read Vera. Okay. Here she is here. Oh, are you doing the work now? Yes, I'm back. I Sorry, I have, it's so musty in this room. I get a little bit of allergies. So we're on Vera. All right, Vera. She was never really punk, just determinedly perverse. <laughs> and odd, odd things naturally came of that. The aloe vera painting was an example. Painting on no money in a studio that was merely the corner of the basement of a dilapidated welfare house, but which had been offered free of charge. Maybe she'd leave some paintings behind, they hinted. She used what she could get, scavenging building sites frequently for metal flashing and scraps of wood siding. Aloe vera appeared on one of these. It was pink and green, a brace of pink outline of a head filled with furious scrambled strokes of fallow green. One ear was indicated with a glued on piece of hot pink cardboard that stuck <laughs> out from the surface in a perfect C curve, a hole directly in the center. In the hole, she placed a green plastic flowering earring of the old screw on type. She took the flip up numbers from a broken clock and placed a single row of pairs of them across the bottom. The pairs meaning something so cryptically personal that even she would forget what it was years later. <laughs> After completing this, she finally wrote Bibi a letter explaining about the aloe vera day. So are we gonna, okay. 
So I did that. I'm going to do it. I thought maybe we just go forward a little bit and go then we'll go back. Yeah. Okay. All right. Dear B, how I miss you. It was short. It was too short, just too short. Uh, the ride back was much less eventful. I learned what to do in the cold and rain. Now imagine this. I bought yellow rubber dishwashing gloves at a, a Kmart to go over uh, my regular riding gloves. Not the preferred moto woman image, of course, but they work great and the price could hardly be beat. Since returning, I've been thinking much of our time, thinking much of our time together. So, so many things to understand and a treasure. There is one which has tormented me though. I never really came to terms with it, I guess, till today. The afternoon of the aloe vera cream. Why have I felt so guilty about this? I didn't, truly I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. It just came out of me, a moment of peak, unrelated to you. Even while I was saying it, I loved the soft green cream against your sweet pink face. You look like spring in every woman as you caress your own skin. I've been cascading myself with thoughtless cruelty in the face of innocence. Can you understand my sorrow? I'm not sure I can. It was a small thing, wasn't it? Yet it stayed. And today this painting has also come. I would send it to you, but it's extremely heavy. Painted on construction lumber. So a photograph soon, okay? Naturally, it's called the aloe vera painting. Keep loving me. I miss you. What I love about this work, Carolyn, and we'll talk about it at the Q&A, is the number of people involved in this. It tells not just one story, but so many stories of couples. Four, at least four couples, if not at more. At least four. Mm -hmm. Someone said that there were five. I think there's four major ones. But then there's these subsets. And I think um, B was included in that in a couple of different ways. So. Yeah, Astrid Ensign, um, in her book, Canonizing Hypertext, mentions five, but I could only come across four major couples myself. Yeah, there are four major couples, but I mean, you could. Be, it depends on how you read it. Like, if you get a, you get into the ones with B and a couple of the other minor characters, more it may seem like that's a major set. <clears throat> that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> Explain still. We met when I worked at a bookstore a few years ago. We had a, uh, he had a decent job then and had enough money to special order books. Um, I just want to say one thing here in the middle of this. It's a little hard to read this. I'm just kind of, it's a little bit really fuzzy. So I'm just, if I stumble, I'm sorry. That's the reason. Later, he told me he would sit and try to think up titles to order. They'd have to have just the right image so he could come into the store more often. After about a year, I guess it takes that long when the woman has eight years seniority, <laughs> I took the first step and acquiesced to what had been more or less an implied request all that time. It was to have a sexual lark. The first, I had never had. My husband had taken my virginity and kept it all those years, but the intensity of the sex was soon being heated by something else. The inevitable, I suppose. No, that's not right. We weren't just falling in love. We do love each other. I, knowing the difference between in love and love, realized sooner than he. I didn't avoid it. Why in the world should one? But he was scared to death. He skirted it, denied it, struggled with it, worried it, and in general tormented himself and me until finally he just accepted it. But he cannot live long without pain. Indeed, he is S to his own M. It became easy enough for him to say, I love you, but agonizing to know he couldn't just have me. Go back to the story map. <clears throat> I'm going to go back a little bit on these story maps. Okay. Close out them. Explaining well. Try to get mm -hmm. closed out a little bit and get back to here. To get into another. Let's go into Mothers. Okay. It's such a lovely yeah. section, I think. Okay. Bring this up. There we go. Lovely. So, let's see. Go into Hedda's Mother. I can okay. get it to open. There we go. I'm trying to get one of these to just open. <laughs> to open. Here we go. Let me go back here. There we go. CS to search. Okay. CS to search. Can you 
move the window just up a little bit. Yeah, it's like kind that. of up. <clears throat> Is that better? A little bit, a little bit more up. That's because the, it covers some of the text, the, the little, yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yes, description. She had nearly given up hope of finding it. Down a narrow alley in the town, shops on both sides, most closed for siesta. A small side glance brought her what appeared to be stacks of old books lying in a window, dim with years of neglect. But peering through, she could see she'd stumbled onto an authentic junk shop. The interior was formidably dense. She had been moving carefully through the piles of dark clutter for some time before she even saw the small man sitting behind a high table. He wore heavy black rimmed glasses. Over his balding dome, he had drawn long hairs from the side of his head. But as always happens with subterfuge, his little veil would not stay put. Long strands looped at strange angles from his temple as he read a book and watched his only customer. I'll move that one up too for you. <coughs> ah, house icon. And que pueda servir, servir, sorry, I can't read that. Yeah. Her arms were full of treasure, half of which she could not even identify. I'm sorry, my Spanish is terrible. Do you have English? See? I was wondering if you could tell me anything about this. She held out a small, flat block of wood painted on one side with a Madonna and child. Ah, see, this is a house icon. Do you know house icons? She shook her head. No, tell me. It's a very old tradition. When people have a new house, a friend will give them a house icon like this for protecting of the house. Look, he pointed at the wall behind him. We have many, we collect them. <laughs> Myriad Maries. Hedda's eyes raised to the wall for the first time since she had entered the shop. There hung a myriad of painted Madonnas, <laughs> all different, most of the paintings looking old, some quite large. They seemed unbelievably beautiful to her. She ached to take them home with her. How many new houses had she moved into in her life, and not once an icon. <laughs> but there was no way to get them back to the States, at least that she could afford. As she panned one last time across the jumbled counter and tabletop, she spotted standing behind some bottles, a three-panel house icon. It was about 10 inches high, each panel shaped like a gothic arch, and hinged so the two outer ones, which were actually half arches, closed inward on the center. It was painted and gilded awkwardly, the Madonna and Child on the center panel obviously decoupaged with some hobby craft technique, but it charmed despite itself, like school art brought home for the front of the refrigerator. Her hand went out, closed, and opened the panels, and quickly put the icon on the counter in front of the now smiling man. <laughs> this one's a long one, so when we get to a certain point, I'll scroll down a little bit. Okay. Move it over. Walk it on. Shall I tell you what it was like to hold her? Crooning soon now, soon to her, while she waited, while she wailed long coils of pain. How she grew whiter and whiter as a bout came on, her eyes sinking, her cheekbones rising. I would hold her and stroke her forehead. She said it helped, but how could it? Really, how could it? Maybe it would be better to tell you about the hundred walks in the halls. Each day she would try, despite pain, everything, to walk a little. She was afraid of withering away. She would take my arm like a teenager going to prom, the other hand always on the railing along the walls. <clears throat> Steps could not be counted. They were too slow, agonizing increments of movement. I would set goals for her. Tomorrow we'll get to the window in the next hall. You can see a beautiful old fir tree, taller than the building from there. She would look doubtful at me and we would take another step. It took many tomorrows to get to that window. And by the time we did, the fir tree was anticlimactic. It was strange, the things I saw out the windows of that hospital. I was the one up and about, running around, taking care of things, able to go on and on with no help, no breaks, little rest. Yet somehow, I thought I saw a red bud blooming from daffodils. 
first time she traveled down the, we need to roll I did. up now. I just did. <coughs> <It'll come. coughs> You're right there, daffodils. Yeah, the first time she traveled down the halls to test, she said from her wheelchair, oh no, I think that's a plum. And aren't those tulips down there? And she was right. I looked at the flowers and she was right. Which of us was the capable focus mama here? <laughs> you're walking and you don't always realize it, but you're always falling. With each step, you fall forward slightly and then catch yourself from falling. Over and over, you're falling and then catching yourself from falling. And this is how you can be walking and falling at the same time. One of my Lori favorite songs. United States Live. <laughs> That's one of my favorite songs from... Um, that is one of my favorite, too. Oh, Superman. I think it's like one of the most philosophical, um, deep... It, it, I use it to explain equilibrium and of the world all the time. I think it's perfect. Yeah, that whole album is full of those kinds of thoughts. <clears throat> A swim. Still, after all these years, she found herself longing for the dim childhood memory of a pond hidden in the woods on the family estate. The sharp and floating cold of immersion as she leapt squealing into the dark water. Myra didn't actually remember the child's piping squirrel, only, only the deep liquid sensation of boundlessness and envelopment. She couldn't have been much more than a baby. But now she stood shivering in a coarse shift, ladling water and streams over her body a woman fully grown and long given to God. She ached for something unnamed. Bookmark to win. This is an email from Hedda to Priam. This is the question. If Mag and Hen leave the Abbey to marry, how safe is it for Margaret? They seem really good for each other now, but would she be giving up her peace for a very doubtful reality? Having nothing but censure from the world can turn a man inside out. Huh. So Priam, so Hedda, good question. Well, it seems to me she's already given up her peace by loving him at all. They're headed for trouble no matter what. If she stays, she won't regain what she had. Nor can Henry stay if Margaret does. They can't be in the same abbey as they are and not love. Nor can they stay there and love. People are alerted to them. Do I understand your question? You know they're going to marry, but you're worried that Henry will abuse her in some way afterwards? Depends on what you mean by abuse. He, he has every sanction in the world to abuse her physically. It was recommended back then. But even if he doesn't do that, he might become silent and withdrawn, though really he's no Avalon. <laughs> besides, they would have to go far away to start over, so they would probably turn more toward each other. How can we know? That's the hazard, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the map. Okay. <laughs> Love and symbols from Hedda to Priam. The Celeris and the Chaplain <clears throat> are becoming both medieval tokens and heartbreaking individuals. In the slow moving and halting, I see the age itself across its centuries, and at the same time, levers of any age, even as even us, restrained by circumstances, but as much in love, maybe more because of it. That's true. Margaret and Henry must be more in love than anyone. Why are they then? Lying in the face of censure, disapproval. God help them. They live in the wrong age for such bravado. <clears throat> Go to another place here. 
BMKs, which are bookmarks, I guess. Mm -hmm, yeah. BMKs. Um, I, and these are like, I, I can't, I don't even really quite remember what I was up to here with this. It's, a, it's another conversation, a meta conversation. Uh, listening, dictation. Had a deprion. Not yet. Just been trying to listen. Guess I should start, huh? What I find interesting about them, Carolyn, is a lot of things. First, it references the first use of email. Yeah. Right. We're talking, the, and the date is 1990. Yeah. And a few us, few of us did have email at that time, but not many. And yeah. it also tries to capture the same kind of look and feel of the header, and all of that. So there's some really nice um, historical yeah. cultural elements that come to play in these in these emails, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's really true. I mean, and, so much has been done with that as a form since that time. It's kind of, I just had forgotten I put these in here. To tell you the truth. And also there were things that we'd say to each other in email. I mean, I don't think we have email exchanges like this anymore. But there was a time in which we really did have deep, like, letter writing experiences with people. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was a brand new form, and it was, the immediacy of it was just irresistible and compelling. I mean, mm -hmm. once you had email, that was it. Prior to Hedda, well, they arrived unbidden, and I'd love to hear them anyway. <laughs> Let's see if I can get back to the main text before we stop and for the Q&A. Okay. Get back here. Are you going into the map then? Yeah, I'm back in the map. I'm just going backwards outside of the bookmarks. And I want to get back to Quibbler. I'm going to see if I can get Quibbler now. Okay. I'm dying to get to that link. Let me see <laughs> if I got it. Is that is, oh yeah, that's in Hedda, yeah. Yes, yeah, in Hedda. Let me go back one more time. Let me try it one more time. Please give me, give me it. There we go. Now I go. Oh, it keeps going back to Hedda. So we'll, we'll do that and just go from there. <clears throat> so it's, com it's coming up. Okay. You want to do that one, Hedda? Yeah. Okay, Hedda. There were times, like when he fell behind her on a crowded sidewalk or when he saw her unexpectedly from across the street. Grace, something. It wasn't the skirt, the way it moved around her, more the angle of her head on her neck, her walk. No, just something else. He had shouted from behind her once, you're beautiful. He didn't know what else to say. <laughs> so we'll go back here and we'll just try one more forward. That's a nice phrase. Five, she is a lover. <laughs> yeah, so. This is nice. Of metaphor, symbol, and ritual. <laughs> Spirals, labyrinths, and the number four. <laughs> These are like those, <clears throat> those things that people put when they want emphasis, they'll put a sentence and a period between every word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Went through days with the sensation of a spot about to be touched. The feeling one has just before opening the door to someone long awaited. The point just past anticipation, which is more physical, like knowledge. Brian's hand, as if he knew how to play piano, falling fingers aiming toward the keys. What first note? What second? Dance of the Furies? Ave Maria? She remembers Bibi once telling about an interchange she had with a very young admirer who had boldly asked her if 40-year-old women could get horny. And her saying, 40-year-old women don't use the word horny. <laughs> That's such a great line. <laughs> Oh. That one actually came from somebody. <laughs> That's a great line. All right, so here's the final, the grand finale. Okay. The quibbler, in some ways less interesting than the extremist, being merely another someone who 
wants it all. But in her appetite for everything, she must allow for the negative space of the impossible, anguish and pleasure, her figure and round. Great. That's a great, thank you, Carolyn, for that reading. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you for letting me do this. It's such a joy. <laughs> I mean, it is such a joy to hear the voice of the author reading their work. And I know it sounds um, fangirlish, but, you know, I, I think about how much I'd love to have heard, you know, Sappho singing. Right. Or, you know, I just, I wish we had tapes of those things and we don't. And so what we're trying to do in the lab is preserve the voice, but also the experience of the reader. And online with us right now in the chat are people who've been chatting all along about this and you know commenting about this and I, I think that's part of the experience is what are people experiencing as they're listening to you read and as they're watching this work unfold and so they're here with us now we've got Mariusz and um, Matthew Hanna and David Alonzo and Dave Sobrowski a lot of folks here watching us um, that will have questions so I'd like to start though in this Q&A we're going to move into that next and bring Mariusz up front with us because he's going to be part of this three-person conversation. Should I go back to the, oh. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> okay, we've got a little lag, right? A little bit of lag, so you're coming on. And so my, my, um, my thought is, Mariusz, you might want to ask the first question. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I would just like, I would just like to start with a, with a comment and with this yin and yang Chinese symbol. Uh, if afternoon a story is the yin of hypertext fiction, uh, for me, uh, quibbling is the, is the yang. Mm. It's just, uh, it just looks like it's been written in, in this afternoon uh, uh, the paradigm in, the, uh, in, uh, in mind. Instead of sharp, dramatic introduction, we have this nice, long exposure. There's lots of colors, lots of textures. It's a very, very uh, womanly, feminist uh, uh, sort of writing. Uh, so my question, my first question would be, um, uh, did you write it thinking about uh, this men's hypertext fiction of the early 90s and, and did you try to introduce something else? Mm. Well, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I would say it was it. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I, um, I would say that it's impossible to have not been thinking about the men's hypertext at the time, because um, I was I was part of that early group, and the men were. I would say I would say they were um, they were very generous to every single person who was trying to write in in a form, and some of those were women, including me. Um, but I pushed against them all the time. Um, I really um, I felt like I, I had to find my own voice in this form, and um, and uh, so I ignored a lot of it while I was writing. I just focused on the writing. And what what came to me during that process, but it's inevitable that some parts of what the men were doing, and, I, and of course I'm speaking of Michael Joyce and Stuart Moffat and, um, and you know the others that were part of that early group. Um, I'm sure it was. It, I'm sure it informed. Certainly it informed certain parts of this work, but I will say that I did try to push against it. Try, I, w I was resistant. <laughs> To some of it, and that's why I was really insistent on the on the map version, on the map version of the thing. Thank you very much. And uh, com coming back to the uh, story, uh, what about the nuns, the Catholic school, and religion, Catholic religion? Uh, is this an experience close to you? Well, yes. Not sure I got all of that. Um, should I be, yeah. Where should I be for this? I think talking on YouTube is fine, and I'm okay. I'm actually monitoring YouTube right now and answering people's questions. Okay. And 
over on that phone. Yeah. So just you just look at YouTube. You're going to be lagging a little bit, probably, but that's okay. Just yeah. answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Again, what was the question? <laughs> I got lost in that. It was about the, the Catholic Church, the Catholic, oh, the Catholic, Church. Right, the Catholic Church. Yes, so, well, yes because uh, I, you know, I was raised Catholic, um, extremely Catholic, where I grew up. was um, uh, Actually, where I grew up was the first Catholic Mass said on the North American continent. And so the culture was all-encompassing Catholic. And um, the, one of the few really powerful uh, role models that a girl would have then were the nuns. Mm -hmm. you know, that was really actually the case that there were the mothers having many, 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 too many babies, and then um, there were the nuns. And those were the possible, you, could, you wouldn't be a priest, you wouldn't, you know, you didn't have a business, you didn't, you know, so that was the Catholic Church. Fortunately, I, I left that area and I, and I, my, I got some other ideas about religion. <laughs> <laughs> One of the works that, you, that I referenced earlier that you talk about in this work is the Women's Myths and Se Women Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, which yes. is such an influential book. And there's so many references to the mythologies um, in this work, you know, including water, including blood, including the colors, even. You know, yeah. that if you open up the book, you can find where you might have been influenced. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, and that's why I kept putting all, all, all the different quotations from the different things that were important to me and that where a lot of the ideas came from were other women that I'd read. And, that, and certainly that encyclopedia of myths and secrets, right? <laughs> I, I was going to go look and see if I could find that book again. I haven't looked at it in so long. Well, Matthew Hanna's writing here, he says, I love the wave image on the cover. It reminded me of the woven cloth, which seemed a fitting metaphor for hypertext. How hard is it to craft a narrative of threads meant to be read as a hypertext? It's a great question, Matthew. Yeah. Um, so I should, I, should, I should answer how hard is it to create a thread? Yeah, he, he really liked your image and wondered, he thought of it as woven cloth, which is, you know, weaving. Is, yeah. It's like woven cloth. It's very much like woven cloth. Um, in fact, you know, the, interestingly, I, I, even in those days, I, I was working in my visual art side, somewhat in textiles and fiber art. And, and I've, over the years, come to concentrate more on that. So for me, um, having a, an image that's like weaving and the waves um, or, and the threads, uh, the threads, the overlapping threads of this work were... Um, it was central for me. Good, good observation. Matthew is going to be joining us, I think, in the fall as uh, an, an associate in the lab, like Mariusz is. And I'm hoping Mariusz will stay with us another year because it's been wonderful having this kind of influence of scholars working with us on these projects. Hmm. Other questions, folks? Uh, Mariusz, do you have another that you'd like to ask? Hmm. I've just found uh, another of uh, Dave, uh, David's question here from the chat. Uh, David is curious about the, how this relates to the history of ebooks. Could this be considered an early ebook? So maybe I also add my question how would you recommend to read this work now for someone who is 18, 20 year old? Mm. Uh, how do I, how would I recommend someone to read Quibbling? Now, after all the experience of ebooks, I, I mean, it's it's of its time. It, it's of its time. You know, it's the same. It needs to be just seen that way. I think it was just. Um, you should read it in the map. Read it in the map version the way I thought you should. Read it. Um, it, it's not. I mean, ebooks. I don't even know anymore what ebooks. I mean. They're just so many electronic versions of print books, right? I mean, am I not understanding the question? No, I think I think um, what happens with a lot of people is they think of, and this is something we put we we have to we have to address a lot in the electronic literature organization is how is elit different from an ebook, and the thing mm -hmm. I tell people is that electronic literature is pie, 
It's participatory, interactive, and experiential. It's mm -hmm. one or all of those things mixed together in some way, whereas e-books are just simple two-dimensional objects that you just move with your, you know, you just kind of swipe at. And maybe sometimes you can hyperlink on things, but really and truly it's meant to be a linear experience mm -hmm. where you, you have minimal input into the work. And um, when I teach electronic literature or digital storytelling, I talk about, you know, even something like Espen Arsett's notion of three dimensions of, of storytelling. Whereas, you know, the, the print, print books, you know, the novels have the time of the telling and the time of the teller. And in this world that we live in, with hypertext onward, there's also the time of the intervention. You know, the time of when the, when the viewer, when the reader intervenes into the text. And that provides a third dimension to any of these works. And that's different than an e-book. Because you really don't have any input into the e-book except just to slap the pages with your hands, right? Yeah. But yeah, and it's better for imagination. Uh, I read hypertext as a cinematic experience. And I think, Caroline, you, you confirmed that in the in Goodwin, there's this nice rephrasing of uh, Aleph metaphor. This magical device from Jorge Luis Borges' story uh, that opens up worlds and worlds uh, from just one little uh, few inch square device. Mm -hmm. This is something that hypertext is, is for me, and it's also mentioned here between uh, in exchange between Heta and Priam. So, hypertext, the, the single text window is like a, a piece of a world or a scene or a film scene that opens up to another scene, another piece of world, and you just navigate it either through links or through the map or as author intended it. A cinematic experience, I think this is also um, a direction we can take if we uh, compare it to ebooks. So it's a, it's a very good good exercise for imagination as well. Yeah, I would say that's right. I agree with that. I agree with both of you. I think everybody should just ask questions now of Dini and Marius, thank you. <laughs> well, I think the other thing we talked about yesterday in a rehearsal is how a lot of artists of, these, of this genre were looking at hypertext as a foundation for how human behavior functions. You know, when we dream, how do you, how do you, relay, our, how do you relay dreams? Right? How do you relay being drunk? You know, having too much to drink, how do, the memory of that, how do you relay these things? And hypertext provided that wonderful format. You know, Judy Malloy's Uncle Roger, you know, in one of the three episodes that she produced, the, the speaker, uh, the narrator, is drunk at a party, and she's trying to remember things that happened, and things are just coming back to her the next day as she's, you know, waking up from this you know, onslaught of drinking too much. And another one, she's had dreams that have been bothering her, and she wakes up remembering bits and pieces of dreams. In your work, you, you, you point out that, that, the, that the story is about these snippets of our lives, the gossip and the inter, little interchanges. They're not these giant, you know, um, Euripides kind of, Sophocles kind of tragic moments. They're small things that hypertext does so well, these fragments. That's an interesting observation. I, I, I never thought of hypertext being the perfect form for that. I always assumed I used it that way, but I think you're right. I mean, the, it's the fragments, the moments, the accumulation of a day um, that makes us who we are and how we understand things. And, and I do think hypertext is Kathleen Zoller asks, I'm interested in how the waves of water symbolizes the interactions between human beings, fluid, unpredictable, interconnected. It's a beautiful metaphor. Yeah, there's actually a, there is a lexia in the work that describes that, how it's, um, the waves, it was actually, it actually was me watching the waves of Lake Michigan coming in and jumping over each other. Um, they gradually be, became a metaphor exactly for um, human interactions. Yes, and for folks here, our, our lakes are not as big as Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan's like being in an ocean. It's so big. So it it's almost like an ocean. 
but here our lakes are kind of small and quiet. <laughs> Yeah, Lake Michigan is an ocean. It's an inland sea, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Marius, do you have another? Hello? Yeah. Do you have another question you might want to ask? Um, yes, actually, um, I, I read this uh, review in Dichtung Digital, uh, the German reviewer, and the, the reviewer had the same questions about one character. Uh, Cora, she is present in one time frame, but then suddenly she disappears uh, in those later years. Uh, but we can find her in the same Cora come lately, Cora come late, which appears uh, uh, further on, but she has not, uh, cannot be spotted in 90s or in 80s. Has she changed the name, or did you change the name of that character, or she just appears then and, and that's it? Um, I think the Cora character was, was uh, certainly a minor uh, part of the work, but um, and I think there was an indication when we were um, looking at this yesterday. I, I, we came across some Cora things, and um, I remembered that um, her name was her taken name as a nun, and her her earlier original name was Jane, and it was a child um, who had become a nun, and what what. Um, that what it was an imagination of that, you know, I spoke earlier about the role models for Catholic girls where I grew up um, were so limited and nuns were the most powerful women to be seen. And so Cora was one of those little girls who, who um, modeled that into the convent. And, and she just, um, she's minor, uh, minor, character, you know, connected to um, connected to the others in lots of ways. A lot. The, the reason that I, <laughs> I had even forgotten that I put all of the main women inside uh, a box named a box titled "None," and it was a way to protect them. I believe when I think back on it now, it's a way to protect them. Um, and so um, the the nun aspect, um, they weren't. Some of them were not very nunly. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it was uh, it was a way. To, there's also a thing I think uh, later in Ismay Pass, uh, Martha Petrie and I explored this a little bit too about nuns and harems, and um, what what the similarities were and how nuns' habits are so sexual sometimes, you know, um, so graceful and uh, mysterious. And um, so I think Cora was just a, you know like a something that might have been for one of these other women who was like related to them in that way. I see. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting you're talking about that because in regard to Cora and the nuns, you know, you, you work with and you mentioned Ismay Pass, which would be probably good to talk about just for a second, in that you were, you had already written Quibbling and Martha Petrie had done Rosary. She was in the middle of working on Rosary and then Michael's Woe, writing on the edge. And then the three of you came together to produce, kind of you hyperlinked your work and produced the fourth work, which was Ismay Pass. There was also some new work within, some new writing within that set of the, of the three pieces. So um, it was knit um, with linking among existing work and then also um, so there was some other new writing just for that. And I think that's the only evidence I have of any work that did that. So that's the only one that came out of that kind of collaboration, which is unique. Uh, yes, I, I think, I, think um, I, I can't remember any others, except that in High Pitched Voices, which was the um, wing of the Hypertext Hotel for a women's collective called High Pitched Voices, we did, um, we, we, the idea of that was for people to put writing up that we share and then, um, people would write into other people's work, you know, and they would um, start writing from and to um, things that existed on there. So that was a little bit like that idea, I guess. Yeah, I think it's good that you mentioned High Pitched Voices because that was your initiative for yeah. women's women's writing. And that, that happened, what, about simultaneously to TENAC? So there's these different kind of work working groups that came together during this period of hypertext? 
yeah, TNAC was uh, earlier. TNAC was um, really um, formed even before I started um, writing hypertext in with that group. Um, that that was <clears throat> uh, they were they were the earliest uh, ones. That was still John. That was still so TNAC sort of continued for a while, and I was I I sort of joined it as an outsider, and I always insisted on myself being an outsider, but. <laughs> <laughs> but they took me in anyway. <laughs> and then High Pitch Voices happened uh, in 93, I think we started that. Yeah. yeah. In, the fall, in the fall of 93. And did you know that Bobby Arlano and his students at Southern Oregon University have recreated Hypertext Hotel as a VR <laughs> environment? Yeah. Yeah. So they've reconstructed it, which is really quite lovely um, because the other version of it doesn't exist anymore, right? I know, including High Pitch Voices part of it. They never brought that over. Yeah. That's that lost. Yeah, I hate losing those early um, those early communities that were so rich. You know, yeah. so we have, you know, had those here and we had Trace Online Writing Center in England that arose in the early night mid early to mid 90s. You know, there's um, you know, there's some that came out of uh, Spain, Madrid and Barcelona. And all of these different groups, you know, emerging, and we're not, it's hard to hold on to them all, but they're important because they, they give us some sort of cultural um, flow from the, from, you know, pre-web writing to current yeah, influence. Yeah, I think that is right, and I, I guess I wasn't really aware of the ones that you just mentioned in Spain. That's, that's interesting. I wish we had known then, but of course, you know, it was, it was still, it wasn't the wide, wide web in those days, you know, the wide world web. Um, it was just um, us on the move, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't the, quite the international connection. There was, but it wasn't the, the way it is now. I mean, if you go online now, you're automatically out in the world. Yeah, so we had, it's interesting to study the different communities in the United States because we had the Coover Brown University group and then we had the well on the west coast right. judy right. and jim rosenberg were part of that group right that's right and they were doing their things there it was just this marvelous rich community that carl loffler you know was was making available and nurturing and then we had coover doing the brown that yeah. mark, mark bernstein kind of tied into right with the hypertext but the two right. communities really didn't come together that much because no. there was no real connection like we have today through the web. It was, right. and what the irony is the web connected us in really meaningful ways, but it also took us away from hypertext as a form, right? As a as a literary form, it took us into other forms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a. It's a remarkable experience right now for me to dive back into all of this after so long. To just remember, it's like rising up, <laughs> rising up to the surface of the water in some ways. Yes, and Mariusz writes here, for those who will be able to read Quibbling, there are important text segments with no links going in or out. That's right. That's because of the map. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the folks that are here on this um, chat also play with twine. Uh -huh. So those of you that are have been playing with twine can recognize yeah. a little bit of twine niche in this hypertext environment called story space. So um, you'll notice that there's some the boxes and the text in the boxes. But the difference is most people when they write in twine still write linearly. It's still tall and there's not a lot of this kind of wonderful fragmentation that happened in the hypertext environment from the early 90s. And so their work is much easier to read now. <laughs> yeah, and they're using it more for gaming kind of experiences. Um, and the choices, it's more of the Borges forking paths. Yeah. There's no yeah. Good area on that kind of thing. So yeah. more interactive fiction experiences than, than the hypertext literary. That's high art. I mean, I think of this as high art. I actually do too. Yeah. yeah. Whatever that means. <laughs> Yeah, and, but you know, sky high. <laughs> but we talked about this yesterday. We need this kind of art. I mean, this is you mentioned Olipo in your yeah. in your text here. I mean, 
most of the people today couldn't reference a lipo, but it was an important literary movement that gave birth to a lot of the practices that yeah. we're experiencing today. They wouldn't be, we wouldn't necessarily have them in place without a lipo. And my argument is hypertext, despite the fact we don't have story space works from the 1992s available for people, unless it's this kind of experience, it still shows them the linkage and the importance and in, in the, um, the impact of this, the high art part of this is so important. Don't want to lose that part. Yeah, it's just intensely creative, I think. And that's, that's the thing that we need in this world. We need people to come back to their own creativity. And, and people who focus on their creativity, we usually call them artists, but that's what we need. And I, I've always felt that everyone has it in them. They just have it squashed along the way, you know. You can't mm -hmm. do that. But we really need that. We need all of our creative instincts about us now in this world, for sure. And Quibbling also shows us that uh, hypertext is nothing to be uh, feared of. Uh, it can be a box of uh, cigars filled with colored uh, stones. It can be a, a soup with different things in the soup, uh, or it can be a, a lake with different coves that we just uh, flow through and go in and out of coves. There are those beautiful visual uh, metaphors of, of the whole experience of quibbling and any hypertext in general, which, which make uh, the hypertext reading uh, something very friendly, nothing too exotic or even if it's a high art, it's a very friendly, or it can be a very friendly high art. I think if you, I think it can be friendly. I think it can be friendly if you just let down a few expectations and start diving in and play with it. You know, Carol. One of the things we're noticing in the lab is that when we do these group readings and we do these kinds of traversals, and the students come, um, they enjoy the work. If we mm -hmm. ask them just to go and read. It's hard for them to do that, but when we do these kinds of experiences, they really like it. And we, we started doing this with Kendall, Rob Kendall's, um, you know, his hypertext, the, uh, the wonderful animation, A Life Set for Two. And we had students reading along with us with that, and they just fell in love with the work because they were <laughs> part of it. So I yeah. think bringing back oral reading, you know, group reading experiences does a lot to to re, um, reacquaint us with the, the beauty of the word, the beauty of high art, and, and it makes people less afraid of it. Yeah. The density. It's less threatening that way. Yeah, I love that idea. So you should just make this not just for um, the records and posterity, but as a regular activity that you do. Mm -hmm. Well, last night we did a group reading of a game which was fun. So we, you know, having people read various parts of it and then mm -hmm. make choices together. Those kinds of experiences bring together communities in a way yeah. that we need to do it, especially now, right, in this moment in our cultural experience with COVID and political upheaval and those kinds of things. We need the calmness of yeah. thought that comes from literary experiences and art. Well, I charge you with that responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you know so much about it. You can go ahead, carry on. It's good. <laughs> well, Dave Dave mentions here. Dave Sabrowski is one of my students, and he's a wonderful student that's um, graduating next semester. Unfortunately, if I let him, maybe I won't. The great thing about reading a story with the author is that you get to hear it the way the author intended, and that's. Mm. So thank you for sharing your time with us. And then Holly says, shared positive emotional experiences. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. It's exactly what you were saying. That's right. It's cathartis. Catharsis, right? Yes. I mean, yes. Aristotle wrote about this thousands of years ago with theater and yeah. poetry. Exactly. Theater. Mm -hmm. that's, a very, that's a very good point, actually. Yes. And this is theater. I call this a performance. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, that's exactly how all the readings were back when we were writing these things and trying to explain to people what the heck they were. Now, I can't tell you how many times we had to explain what hypertext was. 
um, in every conversation. But um, the readings were wonderful, and people loved them, just like you were saying now, that people um, really get into it, you know, whenever um, it's read, especially by the author. Um, there's a kind of, there's something brought to it, um, and that's particular to the work, and then people sort of share it, share the whole experience of it, theater, exactly. When we had Richard Holton here for Fergersky at Finhorn on Acid, he had his beach ball. I don't know if you're familiar with what he did, but he had these two beach balls. One was huge, and he had words written over the various little patches of the ball. You know how when the beach balls are kind of patched together? Yeah, and what he yeah. would do is he would throw the ball out to the audience, and the audience would read the word in front of them on the ball, and then he would go to that lexia and read that lexia. Ah. So it was a way to get a group reading going, and, but it was tossing the beach ball. Like we used to do it at rock concerts. Yeah. Outdoor rock concerts. Yeah. I like that idea. Let's have a concert. Wait, can we have a concert now? <laughs> yeah. Concert. And what else, there was another one that we did. There was Richard Holton's, and then um, there was another one we did that was quite interesting um, based on this whole idea of performance. I think The Unknown by Scott yeah. Draper. Yeah. We were reading it on stage as well with a bell. Yes. Yeah, that was Scott Rittberg, and yeah, that was wonderful. I, I have a, I have one of their um, CDs from their performances in my collection, which I'm proud to have. If there's any more questions, um, let us know, and I, it's about time to call it a day. But um, I, Marius, do you have one more yourself? Uh, no, no. I think I'm, I'm, uh, I've, uh, I've exploited my list. <laughs> well, I well, I, <coughs> Go ahead. I would like to say thank you before we quit. I want to say thank you because um, this has been a remarkable experience and in a lot of ways it's something I never really expected to have, you know, associated with quibbling. I had, I read quibbling in ways similar to this, but in person back in the day, but really I've gone on with my life, and I really have not been writing hyperdicts. I've done a lot of hyperdictual things, but I've not been writing hyperdicts like this for a very long time. And so seeing it again and remembering how important it was to me and how much I believed in it and listening to you and the, the things that you believe about it um, has been a really wonderful experience. So thank you. Well, you know, well, I, was a, I was a graduate student when, um, under Nancy Kaplan when I was introduced to Hypertext, and that was in 1991, and it was Michael Joyce's Afternoon of Story, of course, in a course that she offered her first semester at UT Dallas. And I just fell madly in love with Hypertext. And I, then I ordered Victory Garden, and of course she was dating Stuart at the time, and Stuart was coming up to campus and hanging out with all the graduate students, and so and he was very cool. And um, so Victory Garden was my next work, and then I realized there were women writing. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I was in school, I mean, there was, we were reading all, you know, lots of male writers, Philip Roth and, you know, all of these important male writers, but there were so few women writers that we were reading. And it seemed to me this whole vista had opened up with Judy and then your work and then Diane Greco's Cyborg and, yeah. you know, Kathy Mack and Dina Larson. I mean, they, it was just this, this whole litany of women. It was. Shelley Jackson. I was like, oh my gosh, women can yeah. be professional writers. They're getting published in this weird format. And, um, and luckily, uh, Nancy had shared the beta version of the story space with me because I had a, a lot, I have access to computers at home. And so I was playing with, with, with story space and making my own and ah. thinking about it and thinking about how, you know, how to use it in an academic way, textual analysis and stuff like that. But it was just, it was such a inspiration to read these works as a young, as a younger grade. I wasn't that young. I came back to school later. But as a younger person, realizing that there was a world for women. And everything you wrote about in this work referenced women writers, which we so seldom do for each other, amplifying our own voices mm -hmm. and each other's voices. That is so important that we do that. And you did this all throughout. You cited Lori Anderson, Carol Hybrid. I mean, all these wonderful women. And that was inspirational for all the women I ran with in graduate school. So I just oh, wanted to get that on record to you. It's it, it really important work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
And Carolyn Gurdon, I think, hit it on the, the nail on the head. This is the mother of hypertext, <laughs> a feminist hypertext. It was. I mean, it was the first in terms of its embracing the feminism part of it. Yes, it's, it was maybe the first feminist. Mm -hmm. or it was. Maybe. It is. It still is. <laughs> you would know. <laughs> you would know. Anyway, so as you can tell, I love hypertext. I love this. I love all of you, Lit. And um, it's just been a joy working with you, Carolyn. Thank you for your time. Um, and thank you for sharing this with us. And thank you for the photos that you sent. Okay, I'll send you whatever else I find. Yeah, and I'll put, I'll, we'll put together a collection of care, you know, for the ELO. So anything you send me, we'll put together a collection for the ELO repository so that okay. other scholars have access to it. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for coming today, and I hope to see you at the next event, which is Dina Larson's Marble Springs on December 3rd. And um, Mariusz is going to be leading that one, and I will be sitting in the background and, and, and joining us in the conversation. So join us on that day. Thank you once again, and thank you, everybody in the lab that's been helping. That's great. Thank you to all of you. John and Holly and Kathleen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mariusz. Thank you very much, Dean. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark.